Hi there, it's Miss Camp here with your daily Harry Potter check-in, um, where we left off. Harry's worried about his friend Hagrid, who just started the Care of Magical Creatures class and is worried he might lose his job because Malfoy was a brat and didn't listen. Um, now they're on to their first class with Professor Lupin in Defense Against the Dark Arts. Let's see how that goes. They set off again, the class looking at shabby Professor Lupin with increased respect. He led them down a second corridor and stopped right outside the staff room door. Inside, please, said Professor Lupin, opening it and standing back. The staff room, a long paneled room full of old mismatched chairs, was empty except for one teacher. Professor Snape was sitting in a low armchair, and he looked around the class as it filled in. His eyes were glittering, and there was a nasty sneer playing around his mouth. As Professor Lupin came in and made to close the door behind him, Snape said, Leave it open, Lupin. I'd rather not witness this. He got to his feet and strode past the class, his black robes billowing behind him. At the doorway, he turned on his heel and said, Possibly no one's warned you, Lupin, but this class contains Neville Longbottom. I would advise you not to entrust him with anything difficult, not unless Miss Granger is hissing instructions in his ears. Neville went scarlet. Harry glared at Snape. It was bad enough that he bullied Neville in his own class, let alone doing it in front of another teacher. Professor Lupin raised his eyebrows. I was hoping that Neville would have assessed me in the first stage of the operation, he said. I am sure he will perform it admirably. Neville's face went, if possible, even redder. Snape's lips curled, but he left, shutting the door with a snap. Now then, said Professor Lupin, beckoning the class toward the end of the room, where there was nothing but an old wardrobe, where teachers kept their spare robes. As Professor Lupin went to stand next to it, the wardrobe gave a sudden wobble, banging off the wall. Nothing to worry about, said Professor Lupin calmly because a few people had jumped backward in alarm. There's a boggart in there. Most people seemed to feel that this was something to worry about. Neville gave Professor Lupin a look of pure horror, and Seamus Finnegan eyed the now rattling doorknob apprehensively. Boggarts like dark enclosed spaces, said Professor Lupin. Wardrobes, the gap beneath beds, the cupboards under, sink under the sinks. I once met one lodged itself in a grandfather clock. This one moved in yesterday, and I asked the headmaster if the staff would allow me to leave it for my third years to practice. So, the first, in, the first question we must ask ourselves is, what is a bog art? Hermione put up her hand. It's a shapeshifter, she said. It can take shape of whatever it thinks will frighten us most. Couldn't have put it better myself, said Lupin, and Hermione glowed. So the bogart, bogart sitting in the darkness within has not assumed a form. He does not yet know what will frighten the person on the other side of the door. Nobody knows what a bog art looks like when it is alone, but when I let him out, it will immediately become whatever each of us most fears. This means, said Professor Lupin, choosing to ignore Neville's small stutter of terror, that we have a huge advantage over it and the bog art before we begin. Have you spotted it, Harry? Trying to answer a question with Hermione next to him, bobbing up and down on the balls of her feet with her hand in the air, was very off-putting, but Harry had to go, Er, because there's so many of us, it won't know what shape it should be? Precisely, said Lupin, and Hermione put her hand down, looking a little disappointed. It's always best to have company when you're dealing with the bogart. He becomes confused. What should he become? A headless corpse or a flesh-eating slug? I once saw a bogart make that very mistake. Tried to fight, frighten two people at once and turned himself into a half-slug. Not remotely frightening. The charm that repels a bogart is simple, yet requires force of mind. You see, the thing that really finishes a bogart off is laughter. What you need to do is force it to assume a shape that you find amusing. We'll practice the charm without wands first. After me, please. Ridiculous. Ridiculous, the class said together. Good, said Professor Lupin. Very good. But that was the easy part, I'm afraid. You see, the word is not en enough alone. And this is where you come in, Neville. The wardrobe shook, shook again, though not as much as Neville who walked right forward where he was standing, as if he was heading for the gallows. Right, Neville, said Professor Lupin. First thing first, what would you like to say that frightens you most in the world? Neville's lips moved, but no noise came out. Didn't catch that, Neville, sorry, said Professor Lupin cheerfully. Neville looked around rather, rather wildly, as though begging someone to help him. Then he said it, in barely more than a whisper, Professor Snape. Nearly everyone laughed. Even Neville grinned apologetically. Professor Lupin, however, looked thoughtful. Professor Snape, hmm, Neville, I believe you live with your grandmother? Uh, yes, said Neville nervously, but I don't want the bogart to turn into her either. No, no, you misunderstand me, said Lupin, now smiling. I wonder, 
Could you tell me what sort of clothes your grandmother usually wears? Neville looked started, but said, Well, always the same hat. A tall one with a stuffed vulture on top, and a long dress, green normally, and sometimes a fox fur scarf. And handbag? prompted Professor Lupin. A big red one, said Neville. Right then, said Professor Lupin. Can you picture those clothes very clearly, Neville? Can you see them in your mind's eyes? Yes, said Neville uncertainly, plainly wondering what was coming next. When the Bogart bursts out of this wardrobe, Neville, and sees you, it will assume the form of Professor Snape, said Lupin, and you will raise your wand thus and cry, Ridiculous, and concentrate hard on your grandmother's clothes. If it goes well, Professor Bogart Snape will be forced into that vulture-topped hat, that green dress, and that big red handbag. There was a great shout of laughter. The wardrobe wobbled more violently. If Neville is successful, the Bogart will lightly shift its attention. To each of us in turn, said Professor Neville, or Professor Lupin, I would like all of you to take a moment and think about the thing that scares you most, and imagine how you might force it to look comical. The room went quiet. Harry thought, what scared him most in the world? His first thought was Lord Voldemort. A Voldemort returned to a full strength, but before he had even started to plan a possible counterattack on a bo Bogart Voldemort, a horrible image came floating to the surface of his mind. A rotting, glistening hand slithering back beneath a black cloak, a long, rattling breath from an unseen mouth, then a cold so penetrating it felt like drowning. Harry shivered, then looked around, hoping no one had noticed. Many people had their eyes shut. Ron was muttering to himself, Take its legs off. Harry was sure what he was thinking about. Ron's greatest fear was spiders. Everyone wet ready? said Professor Lupin. Harry felt a lurch of fear. He wasn't ready. How could you make a Dementor less frightening? But he didn't want to ask for more time. Everyone was nodding and rolling up their sleeves. Neville, we're going to back away, said Professor Lupin. Though you have a clear field, all right? I'll call the next person forward. Everyone now, so Neville can have a clear shot. They all retreated back against the walls, leaving Neville alone beside the wardrobe. He looked pale and frightened, but he had pushed up the sleeves of his robes and was holding his wand ready. On the count of three, Neville, said Professor Lupin, who was pointing his own wand at the handle of the wardrobe. One, two, three, now! A jet of sparks shot from the end of Professor Lupin's wand and hit the doorknob. The wardrobe burst open. Hooked nose and menacing, Professor Snape stepped out, his eyes flashing at Neville. Neville backed away, his wand up, whirling, mouthing wordlessly. Snape was bearing down upon him, reaching inside his robes. Ridiculous, squeaked Neville. There was a noise like a whip crack. Snape stumbled, and he was wearing a long, lace-trimmed dress and a towering hat topped with a moth-eaten vulture, and he was swinging a huge crimson bag. There was a roar of laughter. The Bogart paused, confused, and Professor Sloop Lupin shouted, Parvati, forward. Parvati stepped forward, her face set. Snape rounded on her. There was another crack, and where he had stood was now a blood-stained, bandaged mummy. Its sightless face was turned to Parvati and began to walk slowly towards her, dragging its feet, stiff arms raising. Ridiculous, cried Parvati. A bandage unraveled at the mummy's feet. It became entangled, and it fell face forward, and its head rolled off. Seamus, roared Professor Lupin. Seamus darted past Parvati. Crack! Where the mummy had been was a woman with a full length of black hair and a skeletal green-tinged green face, a banshee. She opened her mouth wide open, and an earthly sound filled the room, a long, wailing shriek that made hair, the hair on Harry's head stand on end. Ridiculous, shouted Seamus. The banshee made a rasping noise and clutched her throat. Her voice was gone. Crack! The banshee turned into a rat, which chased its tail and then circled. And then crack! It became a rattlesnake, which slithered and writhed before. Crack! Becoming a single bloody eyeball. It's confused, shouted Lupin. We're getting there. Dean? Dean hurried forward. Crack! The eyeball became a severed hand, which flipped over and began to creep along the floor like a crab. Ridiculous, yelled Dean. There was a snap, and the hand was trapped in a mouse trap. Excellent. Ron, you next. Ron crept forward. Crack. Quite a few people screamed. A giant spider, six feet tall and covered in hair, was advancing on Ron, clicking its pincers menacingly. For a moment, Harry thought Ron had frozen. Then, ridiculous, bellowed Ron, and the spider's legs vanished. It rolled over and over. Lavender Brown squealed and ran away and came to a halt at Harry's feet. He raised his wand, ready, but... Here, shouted Professor Lupin suddenly, hurrying forward. Crack! 
the legless spider had vanished. For a second, everyone looked wildly around to see where it was. Then they saw a silvery white orb hanging in the air in front of Lupin, who said, ridiculous, almost lazily. Crack! Forward, Neville, and finish him off, said Lupin as the bogart landed on the floor as a cockroach. Crack! Snape was black. Snape was back. This time Neville charged forward, looking determined. Ridiculous, he shouted, and they had a split-second view of Snape in his lacy dress before Neville let out a great ha of laughter, and the bogart exploded, burst into a thousand tiny wisps of smoke, and was gone. Excellent, cried Professor Lupin as the class broke into applause. Excellent, Neville. Well done, everyone. Let me see. Five points to Gryffindor for every person to tackle the bo bogart. Ten for Neville, because he did it twice. And five each to Hermione and Harry. But I didn't do anything, said Harry. You and Hermione answered my questions correctly at the start of your class, Harry, said Lupin lightly. lightly. Very well. Everyone, excellent lesson. Homework? Kindly read the chapter on Bogarts and summarize it for me. To be handed in on Monday. That will be all. Talking excitedly, the class left the staff room. Harry, however, wasn't feeling cheerful. Professor Lupin had deliberately stopped him from tackling the Bogart. Why? Was it because he'd seen Harry collapse on the train and thought he wasn't up to much? Had he thought Harry would pass out again? But no one else seemed to have noticed anything. Did you see me take that banshee? shouted Seamus. And the hand, said Dean, waving his own around. And Snape in that hat. And my mummy. I wonder why Professor Lupin was frightened of a crystal ball, said Lavender thoughtfully. That was the best defense against the dark darts lesson we've ever had, wasn't it? said Ron excitedly as they made their way back to the classroom to get their bags. He seems like a very good teacher, said Hermione approvingly, but I wish I could have had a turn with the Bogart. What would have been what would have been for you, said Ron sniggering. A piece of homework that only got nine out of ten? Chapter eight Flight of the Fat Lady In no time at all, defense against the dark arts had become most people's favorite class. Only Draco Malfoy and his gang of Slytherins had anything bad to say about Professor Lupin. Look at the state of his robes, Malfoy would say in a loud whisper as Professor Lupin passed. He dresses like our old house elf. But no one else cared that Professor Lupin's robes were patched and frayed. His next lessons were just as interesting as the first. After Bogarts, they studied redcaps, nasty little goblin-like creatures that lurked wherever there had been bloodshed in the dungeons of castles and in the potholes of deserted battlefields, waiting to bludgeon those who had gotten lost. From Radcaps, they moved on to Kappas, creepy water drillers that looked like scaly monkeys, with webbed hands and itching to strangle unwhittling waters and waders in their ponds. Harry only wished he was happy with some of his other classes. Worst of all was potions. Snape was in a particularly vindictive mood these days, and no one seemed to know why. The story of the Bogart assuming Snape's shape, and the way that Neville had dressed it in his grandmother's clothes, had traveled through the school like wildfire. Snape didn't find it funny. His eyes flashed menacingly at the very mention of Professor Lupin's name, and he was bullying Neville worse than ever. Harry was growing to dread the hours he spent in Professor Trelawney's stifling tower room, deciphering lopsided shapes and symbols, trying to ignore the way Professor Trelawney's enormous eyes filled with tears every time she looked at him. He couldn't like Professor Trelawney, even though she treated, she was treated with respect and borderline reverence by many in her class. Parvati Patel and Lavender Brown had taken to haunting Professor Trelawney's tower room at lunchtimes, and always returned with annoyingly superior looks on their faces, as though they knew things that others didn't. They also started using hushed voices whenever they spoke to Harry, as though he were on his deathbed. Nobody really liked the care of magical creatures either. After the action-packed first class, they had become extremely dull. Hagrid had seemed to have lost his confidence. They were now spending lesson after lesson looking on how to look after flubberworms, which had to be the most boring creature in existence. Why would anyone bother looking after them, said Ron, after yet another hour of poking shredded lettuce down the flubberworm's slimy throats? At the start of October, however, Harry had something else to occupy him, something so enjoyable that it made up for its unsatisfactory classes. The Quidditch season was approaching, and Oliver Wood, captain of the Gryffindor team, called a meeting one Thursday evening to discuss tactics, tactics for the new season. That's as good a place to stop as any. Come back tomorrow for more. Thanks. Bye.